you. I'd like to invite the whole panel back up to the front. And uh, we have some time for questions from these, about these fascinating papers. So. Um, thank you all for the terrific uh, talks this morning. Um, Karen, I, hi, Karen, I'm over here. You can't tell where I am. <laughs> uh, there's no, uh, even in a room, there's a little intimacy actually uh, through these devices right here. Um, so I wanted to connect your talk um, to the talk uh, earlier this morning. Um, and so one of the things that we saw was um, you talked about uh, the early part of this last century where there was a move to, and the pre in the 19th centuries as well, the hot air balloons, the, the you know, World War I planes, et cetera. Um, but I want to uh, move you to uh, you know, the contemporary landscape with Google Maps and satellites um, and the um, you know the uh, the discovery series that's coming uh, of uh, the what is it called uh, the view from space or something like that? What was it? Uh, so I wanted I wanted to ask you um, if that's shifted our understanding. You know the ability for us to be, for example, through Google Maps or Google Earth or whatever to to take this God's eye view uh, and zoom in wherever. Does that, has that, sh and even doing that on our smartphones, um, and not only, you know, so it's kind of the God's eye view, but then we can flip into the human view from the street or things like that. So what's going on connecting those uh, kind of older uh, models of understanding, you know, our, our landscape and our uh, human constructions with uh, this radical new technologies that have come into being? Yeah. Um, thanks, Anupam. That's a great question, and really, uh, you're, I should have should have really wrapped up with that um, in my comments because I know that that's probably of the greatest interest, and it's I'm interested in it too. Um, I guess the first thing that I would say is that I really don't think that these are completely new technologies, and that that's in part what my project is designed to um, um, help um, argue. Um, in fact, uh, a recent piece in relation to my work was titled The Prehistory of the Drone. Um, but I, prehistory is a little, it's, that chops things up a little too neatly. I think that, um, I think of some of these practices um, and forms of in infrastructure as sort of um, circling around each other and overlapping. So um, that said, Technologies work, and then sometimes they don't work. So um, I think that uh, we are offered a promise of a masterful and precise mode of observation um, and perception through contemporary um, imaging uh, and mapping technologies. But uh, we all know that they don't always work, or they're sometimes they're kind of off, uh, and that doesn't matter that much if you have some idea of where you're going. Um, if you're off by a football field because the GPS uh, has a lag or a gap, um, it doesn't matter that much if you know where you're going. If you have no idea, it could, it could make a very significant difference. If you're directing a missile, it could make a really big difference. Uh, so um, I think that what I would say is that People in any era, in any moment, should have a healthy dose of skepticism about the technologies that they engage. And one of the things I try to do with students is to encourage them to learn about how they work, um, what their histories are, um, uh, and uh, to situate them in relation to um, questions of uh, need and use. Um, I, I think that's the way to approach it. But I would just caution about thinking of the, this as like a entirely new revolutionary moment uh, in uh, imaging. I have the microphone, so I'm going to take the liberty of asking a question of David. Um, I'm wondering about, um, so my children before have asked me, what's your favorite day of the week? So we've had conversations about that. So there's clear Oh, Wednesday, sorry. Well, Friday. Oh, no, I thought you were asking. <laughs> oh, no, what, what is your favorite day of the week? <laughs> so mine's Friday. And we've also talked about before that they, I know my son in particular has 
sadness on Sunday nights because of having to go back to school. And <laughs> the, dean, the dean does too. <laughs> so what I'm wondering is, is um, did people express emotions about days of the week in the 19th century, or is that sort of something that you see more in, in our times? Uh, no, they did. They did. Uh, um, you know, the, uh, different kinds of emotions, depending on which people they were. Uh, uh, one the easy generalization to make is that New England diarists in the first half of the 19th century uh, were often melancholy when they wrote in their diaries on Saturday night or on Sunday, uh, typically because they associated it with the swift passage of time. Uh, which was not a happy thought for them, um, and also because they associated it with their failures to live up to prior resolutions. The, the, comparable, the comparable moment in the calendar for, in, within that subculture was January 1st, which I think we can relate to a, a little better. We, we often see January 1st as times of resolutions. That was alluded to earlier in that chocolate and diet. Uh, uh, graph that we saw. Uh, um, I don't think that Sunday's sadness um, in the cultures, Vicki, that you have, have in mind is quite as much associated with the swift passage of time or the failure to, to be productive or to adhere to prior res resolutions. Uh, my, my hunch, though, and, and one of the things I'm interested in is the way in which the, the pattern of being sad in a particular day of the week or happy actually is self-reinforcing because the day comes to seem to have, uh, so people who are often liberated from or exiled from the, uh, the weekly schedule that produced their dominant associations, um, often their fondness or loathing for a particular day of the week survives that liberation or exile. So, you know, um, some people love Friday. If you ask them why, the honest answer they often give you is because it reminds them of being free from school on Friday. And this, this could be referring to a period in their life that, that is long gone, but it's still there. Uh, the phenomenon of Sunday depression, Sunday suicide, which has been studied uh, mostly in, 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 the, in, the, in the 20th century, could possibly be about that as well. This is a question for Carolyn. Um, I wonder, I'm curious about the, if you have a sense, I'm imagining that maybe part of the uh, positive impact of the online, or the flipped classroom that you talked about uh, is built in or it's part of it. But the, I'm wondering if there's a part of it which is also contrast. In other words, like if all your classes were flipped classes, might you then get excited about a big lecture class? Or, you know, is there something like that? <laughs> That's a great question. How much of it is just that there's variety and we long for that, especially as classes get larger, all classes take on a kind of uniformity. Um, there is the, a halo effect, and so it's something to study. When someone flips one class over time, elements to their other classes also increasingly move to be put into modules as well, or that it's just something people use more in the classroom. But I think that that question is also, you know, how much of this is just about innovating? It's fun because you're innovating, and then it wouldn't necessarily be fun. Um, interestingly, as these classes appear, now they're not always taught by the people that designed them, right? So they move to someone else. People that pick up the class don't find it the same way as engaging. Um, there are different struggles that they have with it. So it's, yeah, it's a really good question. I'll think about it. Because one, one thing on that is a, sort of, uh, the non-expert, but the sort of person that you're talking to. Uh, um, Carolyn's presentation, I think, leaned much less heavily upon the usual stuff you hear about the limited attention span or diverse learning styles of a new generation of students and much more on the kind of ennui uh, that faculty feel. And uh, from that perspective, right, if, if flipping the classroom is really not simply about catering to learning styles of students who are different from the ones we taught 20 years ago, uh, but just diagnosing the phenomenon that we do something somewhat 
isolating and unsatisfying for a living and that flipping the classroom uh, can actually reinvigorate our, our lecturing. Uh, uh, it's not simply the novelty of it from our perspective. It, 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 it is actually just, uh, uh, just calling attention to a problem that I think people have difficulty naming. So, so in that sense, yes, it probably is about the, the novelty and the innovation, but that is precisely the point from as I understood her, her talk. Yeah, maybe uh, just to reinforce this point, when I did some training recently in software carpentry, which is a group trying to figure out how to rapidly teach people some like faculty basic skills in programming, they drew upon a history of education where they said, you know, is uh, phonics versus whole word learning, like which is better? And they said in the history of education, there's been endless studies of this and when I think the nation of Britain did a study of it, what they found was actually what mattered wasn't which one you taught, but teacher motivation. And that the kind of series of rapid revolutions that we often make fun of also have this side effect of re-motivating uh, teachers. And that it's really interesting to think about how that is also being uh, built in. And then as Carolyn was pointing out, uh, as hybrid gets standardized or gets handed off to other people, we need to kind of pay attention to this, this particular problem. So then where does the five minute module come from? Is it coming from our knowledge of students' attention spans? Is it coming from the technology, the way Twitter is limited by characters? Or is it coming by, that's how long a professor can focus on a topic? So I think it's sort of um, a combination, right? There's a limited amount on YouTube that you can put up. I don't know if it's 15 minutes or, you know, there's, there's these bites. What, it, what is the amount, those of you who actually know? Yeah, it's big. You can, you can, you can watch big. a whole concert now. Yeah, but it has to do with the amount of time that students need to access it and then the other things that you build into it. And the total, the total amount of, of bandwidth that's available for the activity. So the number that, w that we go with is 15 minutes as a, a time a YouTube-based module would happen. Then over time, people realize 15 minutes is too long. So the five to seven minutes. And, and, but then this goes to education theory, right? So if what we're talking about is that this is primarily a creative process for faculty and that we ought to have more ways to focus on being creative. And the primary job we have day after day is teaching students then you know, all of these other things may need to be rethought. Five minutes to seven minutes followed with a quiz is the amount of time that students can handle in order to get three or four key concepts. But maybe that's not what this should serve, ultimately. Maybe there ought to be something where people after X number of years move into a space where teaching the primary labor has a creative influx. And there are multiple modes of what that creative influx would look like. Um, but you know, I hadn't actually thought about that that question, and the, the parameters that already exist are setting a lot of what we're talking about as success, right? Because, well, that, a student learning faced activity should only be that long, or this only fits into this space as opposed to what are we really trying to, to do? And you don't need technology to do this. That's the other thing. You, you don't, it's a much longer conversation. It's a frame. It's a frame that people step into and then they say, whoa, this is totally new. And there's a low threatening aspect to it because you're so disoriented as you're trying to learn the new technology. It's a place to ask questions about how could this be different. You can also do this by using data and simply showing what's going on in the classroom. Very briefly, one interesting study is if you actually give um, students in the room a little device and let them tell how often is the professor talking, how often is there time to think about a question and how often are students talking, a lot of faculty find that incredibly illuminating. They have no idea the ratio that they're talking to what they even make available to students to participate. So. All right, please join me in thanking this panel and continuing the conversation.